or did any walkthroughs or studios. Uh, so kind of want to take a look back at um, kind of what we had going on um, and and then take a look at where we are now. Um, so if you remember kind of in our last uh, studio, we updated Flicklist um, to use the database to store our um, movies persistently. Um, so what that meant is we go to our website, right? we can see the list of movies that we would like to watch, uh, we can look at the ratings that we've given those movies, see the movies that we've watched already. Um, however, uh, once our website is published and open to the public, um, kind of anyone that anyone that goes to our website um, can see that list, can add movies to that list, um, can rate movies, or can say that they've watched movies, um, even if they haven't. Right. Um, so what what we would like is instead of kind of having our our website open uh, to the public and letting any user that comes in logs into our website. Um, update and change uh, any data stored in our database, add movies, um, say that they've watched movies, anything like that. What we'd really like is kind of uh, to allow users to log in and each, lo each, each user has their own list of movies they'd like to watch, um, their own list of movies that they've already watched and their own ratings. Um, so today uh, kind of we're gonna move towards incorporating users into our website or into our application um, and allow each user to have kind of their own their own view uh, their own list uh, their own view of the website right so uh, we've made a lot of changes a lot of refactoring to the code kind of to get ready to introduce users to our uh, to our application um, I want to quickly go through um, some of those changes now Uh, so if we if we just start kind of at the top of our of our main Python file, um, kind of the first thing we'll see is we import hash utils. Um, hash utils is a Python file that we've written. Uh, it basically includes kind of um, some some nice hashing operations, um, and I'll go through this in more detail at the end as we see kind of where where these hashing functions are used. Uh, so if we jump back to our Python file, um, kind of move down, uh, we'll see that part of having kind of incorporating users into our into our website is we need um, a database somewhere to store user information. Right. So just like we created um, kind of a movie model, uh, we'll also create a user model. Right. So our user will have a username and also a password and that password will be hashed uh, for protection. Right, so now that we have this user model um, we can kind of add users to a database. Right, so um, by making a new model um, we're creating kind of a new a new table in the data store. Right, so that new table we can um, push users into it right, and it'll store kind of users. It'll be a separate table from um, our movie table, uh, but what we'll see is we can kind of link the two together by um, incorporating a username or a user into our movie model, um, and we'll do that kind of in the walkthrough um, later. So uh, we've also added uh, if we come down to the bottom, we'll see that kind of we have added three new routes and three new handlers to our uh, to our application. Right. So if we want to have users, we need users to be able to register. So they need to be able to create create an account. Uh, we also need users to be able to log in and log out. And so let's take a look kind of at the um, register action, the register route. Right, it goes to the register handler. Uh, so here's our register handler. Um, if we check out our get method, right, we simply render register.html. So we create a template uh, for register.html, which we'll take a take a peek at in a second. Um, render that template 
with no heirs for now. I'm kind of as uh, the heirs will get populated, um, kind of as we as that uh, as the post method gets called and we verify username, verify passwords, we may fill those errors in and kind of redirect back to this page. Uh, but for now, uh, we render the template, fill it in with blank errors, the default blank error messages, um, and write out that response. So give send the user to uh, that register page. And so if we take a look at kind of what that looks like in HTML, what our template looks like, um, once again, kind of we style errors to be read. Here we have our sign-up page um, and create a form that calls the post method um, of our register handler. Right, so we have um, input for a username. Uh, we also kind of have our placeholder to pass in error messages if, if an error message is occurs. Um, we also have a form for a password, right? So remember kind of the uh, type, the input type password will show up as dots. Um, so as we're typing, people won't be able to see what our password is. Um, once again, we leave kind of a space for an error to be passed here. Um, and kind of with any sign up page, uh, we ask the user to just verify their password again to make sure um, they typed it correctly um, and it is what they would like. Um, so then we have submit button uh, and also just a link um, kind of if the user has already logged in a link to to the login page. Uh, so if we kind of jump over to um, inside the Google App Engine, take a peek at that page, uh, what we see, right, we have our standard uh, base HTML, uh, the flick list at the top, um, our list and ratings, links to get to those, um, and then we have kind of our, our register.html uh, template gets filled in as the content to our, to our base HTML template, um, and we see kind of the forms to fill in our, our username, password, and submit, and we see the link to log in. So at this point, kind of a neat thing to see is we've already implemented kind of the protection from the other from other pages if a user is not logged in. Um, so if we try to kind of go to any of these pages, um, what we see is we are redirected to the login page um, and ask a user to log in before they can see or update um, kind of any other any other pages. Um, so I will get to we'll see kind of how that's done um, later uh, in this in this little walkthrough. So if we jump back to the code here, right, remember um, when we submit from the register page, it calls the post method. So let's jump back uh, to our register handler and kind of take a peek at the post method. Um, first thing we do is grab, grab the input uh, that the user gave to us. Um, and then we simply validate the username, uh, validate password, and validate verify. Um, so we can We'll take a peek at what those do in a minute, um, but let's kind of finish out the rest of this post method before we before we do that. Um, right, so kind of first thing we do is create our error list in case we will have any errors. Um, and initialize initialize uh, has error to be false. Uh, we'll check that at the end. If we do have an error, we'll kind of re-render the page and output those errors. Um, so uh, we can. Um, check to see if the username given to us by um, by the user um, already exists. Um, so first thing we'll do is call get user by name, uh, which is a function that uh, we've defined. We'll take a peek at a little bit later, see how it works. Um, right. So if that user exists already, um, we simply set the username error, right, which we the username error um, to the username with that username or that username already exists, right? And we set has error to be true. Um, at this point, we kind of check our verified our verified username, password, and verify. If all of those things are correct, um, we 
hash our password so we can store the user's password in our database. Um, right, remember, we want that to be protected. If we store the password as plain text, um, someone hacks into our database or gets access to our computer, gets access to the database somehow, they, um, they also have access to everyone's passwords if they're stored in plain text. Right? So, we, so we hash our passwords always to be safe. Um, we create a new user, right? So we saw, we saw um, previously that we've created the, a new user model. Uh, has a username and a hashed password. Um, and we simply add that user to our database or to our user table and then log in that user. Um, so we'll see what login user and logout user um, does in a minute. Uh, for now, we'll just kind of assume the user is logged in. Right, and logging in the user also kind of redirects us uh, to the home page, right? So once once the user is logged in, we can redirect to the home page. They can see their list, um, and kind of everything on the home page and the watch list will be specific to that user. Um, however, if we if an error occurred, uh, so if we have an error, um, the login was not successful. Um, then we simply set set the errors that happened. Um, so, if we don't have a username, um, kind of we set a username error. If we don't have a password, set a password error. If the password's not verified, we set a verify error. All right. So, what all of these functions do um, will return nothing if the verification failed, um, and will return kind of the correct output or the the username, password, or verify if if that um, verification passed or if that validation passed. Right, so kind of at this point if these don't exist, so if not username is true, um, a username, right, the username was not validated correctly, uh, passed or failed verification, right, so we can output or give an error message uh, that that it was not a valid username. Right, so then, kind of, if we have an error, um, we simply re-render the register.html uh, template. Right, remember, we can pass in our errors now. Um, so when we rendered it the first time in the get in the get method, right, errors um, defaulted to be empty. Right, so now we've filled in our errors here. And this, right, we can pass that list of errors or that dictionary of errors into our register.html um, write out that response. Right? If we pass verification, create a new user and log that user in, uh, we simply redirect to the home page. So let's kind of take a look at how the errors fill in now. And so I'll also um, just use this time to kind of look at what the login page looks like. So just like we have a register page, uh, we'll also have a login page to allow a user that already has a, an account to log in. Um, so the login page uh, is very similar, right? But instead of verifying, instead of having a verify field to verify the password, um, we simply submit, um, check the database, check the hashed value, make sure that password's correct. Um, and then at that point, Kind of the users logged in, we can redirect them to the home page, right? Um, we also have a link to the register page. So if a user doesn't have account, an account, um, they can create one. That'll take us back to our register page, right? So let's see kind of how those errors fill in now. If I let's just leave these all blank, um, and we'll see kind of if they're blank, we get an error for all of them. Um, let's see. I have already created one account. Right, so if we see this, um, if we type in a username that already exists, um, kind of we'll see the correct corresponding message or error message for for that error. So let's jump back to the code. Um, we won't take a peek at the login template because it's pretty you know pretty straightforward what's going to be there um, by just by looking at the web page just now. Um, so let's now take a peek kind of at the login route and the login handler.
right? So if we check out our get method, when we go to the login page, we simply render the login form, right? Rendering the login form, um, just like rendering the register form, um, sets Jinja up with the right template, renders that template with um, the correct errors, uh, writes that response out, so sends the user uh, to the login page. Right, if we check out our post, right, remember we asked the user to submit a username and a password, so we grab those. Um, once again, we check to see if the user exists. Right, We're not registering now, we're trying to log in. Um, so kind of at this point, if the user doesn't exist, um, then we want to tell them you know, that it's an invalid username. Right, The user doesn't exist. Um, we also want to check the given password against the hashed password that we have stored for that username. Right, so um, if the password's invalid, we return an invalid password, re-render the form uh, with the invalid password. Otherwise, if the username checks out, the password checks out, uh, log the user in, redirect them to the home page. I would like to step back for a second and kind of look at um, a way we use regular expressions to validate um, kind of usernames, passwords, and things, um, and just explain kind of what's going on a little bit. Um, something I skipped over when we were looking on the registration page. Uh, so if we step back and remember um, when we when we take in a username, password. Um, we call these validate functions. Right? So I wanted to take a peek at those validate functions and see how we use regular expressions there to do that. And so if we look at um, kind of validate username is the most interesting. Um, what we see is we create this regular expression object uh, that we can use to match against the username. Um, so what this regular expression says is kind of um, we we take any any character um, a through z at lowercase a through z uppercase zero through nine underscore or the dash um, so any character in that in that kind of list or in that range is valid um, and what we see here in these brackets is that any any amount of those characters, any number of valid characters between three and twenty, um, will be a valid password. And so that's basically what that's saying is, um, or a valid username. And so a username must be at least three characters, at most twenty, and it can be any of these. It can be in the range of A to Z, lowercase, in the range of A to Z, uppercase, a digit from zero to nine, underscore or a dash. Right, kind of similar thing with the password, but passwords, uh, we do the dot, uh, which basically says any digit uh, will work, or any character, or any symbol will work. Right, so in this case, we don't have the restrictions that we have up here, of only this kind of set of valid symbols. Right, and then to verify um, or to validate the verified password, uh, we just simply check that that the password and verify are equal. Um, so we've also used um, one more function we'll go ahead and take a look at now, um, which is this get user by name function. Um, right, so that's implemented in the handler class. We've implemented quite a few helper functions in the handler class that you should take a look at um, and get up to speed on, um, but I'll just kind of go through them kind of as we use them. So if we take a look um, here in the handler class, we've implemented kind of the login and logout users, which we'll take a closer look at at those um, later when we're talking about the cookies that we've introduced. Um, for now, let's kind of take a peek at get user by name. Right, we simply take an input username, um, query our database, query our user database now. Right, so we're not querying for movies; we're querying. Um, kind of the user table, 
right? And we're grabbing um, any records where the username is equal to the to the parameter passed in, right? Um, if that user exists, right? So if we get some return value, um, then we grab that user's record out of the table and return it. Um, so then at that point, kind of we have a, a valid user, right? We can go from there. Um, so let's now check out the logout handler. Logout's pretty simple. Uh, we simply, um, if we if we take the logout route, um, it's a get method. We log out the user, and redirect to the login page. So at this point, um, no users logged in, so they they don't have access to the home page, their list, the watch list. Um, any routes um, except for the ones we specify as valid routes for anyone to go to that's not logged in. Um, login is one of those to allow that user to log in. So we just redirect them there, log the user out. Okay, so now that we've seen kind of the new routes and new handlers that we've added, um, I want to take a look at the helper functions that we've implemented in the handler class um, to kind of allow us to log in users, log out users, and also set up the block um, block pages for, uh, that uh, the public can see, right? So block the pages that a user needs to be logged in to be able to see. And so we'll start with kind of blocking pages that the user or that a non-logged in user can see. Right, so there's, um, we have this initialize function. Um, so every the web app to uh, request handler has an initialize function um, that initializes kind of the response messages. Uh, but we can also override or extend that function kind of in a subclass of web app to request handler. Um, so we're gonna, what we're going to do here is kind of implement our own initialize function. Um, so what this does is anytime a HTTP request comes in and our request handler um, is about to handle that request, it first runs this initialize function. Um, so that allows us to kind of check, make sure that a user is logged in. If a user is not logged in, um, then that HTTP request, we can kind of throw it out and redirect the user to the login page. Um, so if we look kind of what that looks like um, from the code, it is first thing we do is read a cookie, right? So what we do when we log in a user, which we'll see in a second, is we set a cookie um, in their browser, right? So then um, as that as we get that HTTP request, that cookie should be set. So we'll grab it here, um, check to see if it's the correct cookie that we expect, and we'll also check to see that the user exists in the database or that that user ID that the cookie is set to exists in the database. Um, if both of those things are true, um, we allow that request to be handled um, as it would normally, right? So remember this is initialized, uh, so we're simply trying to kind of block non-logged in users from, from, cert, from uh, requesting certain pages, right? So if, if the user is valid, is logged in, the request goes through as normal. Um, however, if uh, we don't have a user and the request path is not in the allowed routes, um, so if we kind of take a peek at this allowed routes, we've created a list up here. So um, basically these routes are the routes that are open to the public that any user can get to without logging in. Right, so If the request path, um, so the page or the path, the route that the uh, non-logged in user is requesting is not in that allowed routes um, list, right, then we redirect them to the user or to the login page so that they can log in um, and then get to, get to that page and make that request successfully. Right, so now we're ready to kind of take a peek at how we use cookies to log users in 
and log users out. Right, so if we check kind of our login user, remember this function gets called um, from the login from the login post method. First thing we do is um, take the parameter, the user ID that was passed in by the login post method, um, and we try to get that user out of the database by its ID. Right, so remember the ID is an index that allows us to grab the user object from our table quickly. Um, and what we do next is we send in our in our HTTP response, um, we send the user ID and a user ID um, cookie. Right, so what we'll see um, the set secure cookie method. If we kind of take a peek right down here, uh, we simply make our cookie secure. Right, so we hash it with a secret um, appended to it, so that we can kind of check that hash and make sure it's the same as it should be, and that the user didn't change their user ID in any way. Um, then we kind of add a header. Um, so remember, in our response, we can access the headers by getting the header object. And we can add a header to the headers by using the add header function. right? And so uh, the command or the header that we're going to request the brow their browser saves for us um, is this set cookie. So we're requesting that the browser sets a cookie. Remember that that um, sets the specified cookie field here equal to some value here. Um, so we're setting, so we're passing in a name. We're setting that cookie equal to the value that we'd like. And we're giving it kind of a path of the of the home page, right? So that'll work. That's kind of the um, top level path. Um, so any of our web pages, uh, so the browser will send us this cookie um, for any web page or any request, any HTTP request, kind of starting at that path and beyond. Um, so what that means for for our purposes is any any page or any handler um, that we've implemented that the user requests or that we get an HTTP request for, um, that cookie will be sent along with it. Right? So that will match that path. Right, so if we take a look back at kind of login user, right, we pass in the name of the cookie, user ID. Um, and we pass in the user ID string. Right, so what that's going to do is set user ID cookie um, to a, a secure hash of the user ID string. Right, when we log a user out, um, we simply set the secure cookie to blank. Right, so we're passing, uh, we call set secure cookie, right, which is going to change the ask the browser to set its user ID cookie um, to be empty, right? This empty character, empty string. Um, so it's essentially going to kind of delete the cookie that was telling us that the user is logged in. Right, so we see that our initialize function Right. This is the one that allows a request to either go through or blocks that HTTP request. Um, calls this read secure cookie um, method using the user ID. Right. So if we recall, when we log in, we set this user ID cookie. When we log out, um, we reset it to be empty. Right. So let's take a peek. Kind of um, when this initialize function gets called, uh, it calls read secure cookie. Let's kind of take a peek at what that method looks like. Right, we first um, check the HTTP request. Right, remember we can grab any cookies that um, were sent in that HTTP request. So remember, um, the request handler will group those into a list for us or into a dictionary for us. Um, so we can use the get function, right, and we pass in um, which 
key value we'd like to get out of that out of that dictionary. Um, so when initialize calls this function, calls it with the string user ID. Um, so name here will be user ID. Right, so we check we're checking for a user ID cookie. Um, if that cookie is included in the HTTP request, um, that tells us that um, the user might be logged in or that user ID cookie is set. Um, so then we simply check to make sure that the hashed value we received with that cookie is equal to what we would expect it to be. And um, we'll see kind of we'll take a look at these hash util functions now and kind of describe how we make sure things are secure um, using hashing. So let's pop over to the hash utils uh, Python file that we've written. Um, what we see is kind of first thing uh, we do is we import random. So we'll use random to um, kind of create salts for us. Um, we also import the hashlib library that we saw a little bit last time in class. Right, hashlib gives us um, access to those hashing functions, and we also import uh, the hmac library, um, which gives us access to uh, to these functions to create um, hashes with secrets from from our uh, from our cookie values from our user ID right that allows us to secure to secure our cookies now, so I would like to at this point kind of make one correction to what I said in class on Monday and so hash functions are always um, kind of one-way functions only um, so when we hash some input data or some input value and we run the hash function on that um, the output we get is is generally um, a fixed length, right? Where that input could be um, any length, right? And what we see is kind of uh, there are sometimes collisions, right? So one thing with moving uh, a large, a large or unrestricted amount of data to kind of a set length um, output is that multiple inputs may map to the same output, right? So that makes kind of hash functions. Um, one way only, right? So good hash functions, um, secure hash functions are uh, hash functions where it's hard to find those collisions, right? So um, the output is big enough that the collisions on the input side are few and far between, right? So um, it's not it's not very common that two passwords that someone may enter um, would hash to the same to the same hash, right? So that means um, it's safe to compare kind of hashed values with that password hashed again uh, to ensure that it hasn't changed. So let's sort of start with um, how we handle hashing our cookies. Right. So remember, um, our cookies get stored in the user's browser. Um, that user has the ability to change their cookies through the browser or delete their cookies or modify them to to say something else right so remember to avoid kind of a user setting a user ID to something uh, to someone else's user ID and spoofing our site um, into thinking that they're logged in as a different user right remember we uh, we hash we hash our cookie values before we send them over and store them in the browser. Um, so when we get that hashed value back, um, we can, or when we get a, a combo back that has the unhashed value and the hashed value, we can rehash that value, or we can rehash the uh, user ID in this case, make sure it equals our hashed value. Um, and then we're, we consider it safe that the user hasn't changed hasn't changed that value. Um, it's kind of obviously a user if they know what hash function we're using um, could change the user ID and also hash that value um, and store and change the user ID cookie um, 
to be a new user ID and the correct hash value if they know which hash function we're using. Um, so to avoid that, uh, we use a, a secret. So what we see here is kind of we create the secret that only we know. Um, so it's usually just a random string of characters. Right, so now what we see is kind of on the back end, um, we as, as the website developers, um, we know this secret. Um, however, the user doesn't. So if, if someone wanted to spoof that user ID or spoof that cookie um, and change uh, the user ID to something else, even if they knew the hash function we were using, if they rehashed that user ID that they updated it to, um, stored that along with it, um, whenever, we check, uh, whenever we check those values on our side, uh, we're appending the secret to the user ID. Right? So the hash the hash value or the results of, of the hash function is going to be much different um, because we've appended the secret onto it that anyone outside of, of our kind of developers or of, our, of, uh, of us, uh, they don't know this secret. So if they tried to rehash kind of the user ID, um, that wouldn't work out, right? It wouldn't have the same hash value that we have um, because they haven't appended the correct secret onto that user ID before they hashed it. Uh, so we use right, make secure val um, to create this hash. Right? So uh, essentially what that does is um, creates a, a value. We're returning um, a string that is just simply the user ID or the value that we're hashing. Right? So for our case, uh, it's the user ID. Um, so we separate kind of the original ID, the original unhashed value, um, with the hashed value. Right? Uh, if we take a look at kind of what hash string looks like, um, we create a a new hex digest. Right? So remember, um, hex digest gives us the the string, the created string in hexadecimal form, uh, so hex characters, right? So this hmac.new um, simply creates a new hashed value um, using the secret and and the string that's passed in, or the value that we're hashing, right? So that's usually done by just appending the two together um, and then running them through through the hash function. Um, so, so what we see here is kind of the, the actual value and um, what this maps back to uh, when we set the cookie is the actual value passed um, for that cookie, the value that it equals um, is not only the hashed hex digest um, but also the original um, value. Right? So at this point kind of if we look at check secure val, right? so if we're when they request the page and that cookie's added, um, when we want to check check that cookie to make sure it's what we expect it to be, um, we can simply split the value of the cookie on our kind of or symbol or our our up and down bar, right? So remember, uh, what's to the left of that up and down bar is just the original the original value, the original string. Um, what's to the right? is the hashed value, right? So we want to grab, we want to split that. And what that does is it um, splits on that on that character and um, we want to take kind of the left side of that or we want to take the first section of that um, by taking the zero index of that. Right, so in this case S is going to be equal to the kind of the, the original value, um, the unhashed value of, of the cookie. Right, so um, once again, in our case, kind of the unhashed user ID. Right, so then all we have to do is remake this secure val with s and compare it against our original um, cookie value that was passed in to us. Right, so remember, um, a user could not create a new hashed value um, that would be the same as ours for a different user ID, right? Because we have access to the secret and they don't.
So let's go ahead and take a look at how we um, secure our passwords now. Right, so remember, um, when a user registers, we make a password hash and we store that in our database. Um, that allows kind of anyone who might have that, who might get access to our database or anyone who has access to our database um, cannot see our users' passwords in plain text. Right, there's some there's some hashed value. Um, right, so unlike um, unlike cookies, where we remember we send along a pair, so we send the unhashed value along with the hashed value, uh, and we only want to detect that kind of the value, uh, the unhashed value hasn't been tampered with, so the user themselves hasn't changed that cookie, um, hasn't hasn't changed the cookie's value, and is trying to uh, kind of spoof our website and act as someone else or uh, some other way change the cookie to do to do something um, we're just simply right remember with the cookies we're just simply checking to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with it hasn't been changed uh, with passwords it's a little different right we can't store kind of a a combo we can't store the unhashed password along with the hashed value right because then anyone who has access to our database um, could simply just use that unhashed password right that user might um, use the same password for multiple websites, right? So if they gain access to the password on one website, they might be able to kind of hack that user's account on multiple other websites. Um, so what we do with securing passwords is we only store the hashed value, right? Um, so what that means is kind of when the user inputs their password, um, that gives us the unhashed password itself. And uh, then we can simply hash that password and make sure it matches up with the hashed value uh, that we have stored. Right? So what that means is we kind of always have to use uh, the same hashing function. Right? So we're going to use um, SHA-256. Right? Remember it's more secure than MD5 and SHA-1. Um, a common attack when uh, without salting. Let's talk a little bit about why salting is important. Um, so much like we append a secret to our uh, to our cookies when we make that uh, value secure, when we hash that value, uh, we're going to append a salt to our passwords before we hash them. Um, so a common attack is called a rainbow table. Um, and essentially what what hackers or what people have done is and kind of for the common hashing functions um, have just simply brute force tried um, every different combination of characters um, running it through that hash function they get out the the hashed value and then store in a table um, kind of the password to that hashed value right so what that means is if they if at this point um, they were to hack a website or hack our database that uh, stores our users passwords and the hashed value now uh, they could simply look up in that table the hash value and get and get the possible passwords uh, that may correspond to that hash value right so obviously that's not good right we don't want um, hackers or an attacker to be able to do that um, that quickly right so the hard part of that of that attack right is creating that table in the first place it takes a lot of time uh, but once the table is created it's really quick just to kind of look up uh, the hash value and get out what password it could possibly be um, so what we do to kind of make creating that rainbow table infeasible um, is add a is append a salt to our to any password kind of before it's hashed um, right so what that does is increases the length of the password by increasing the length um, we kind of make it computationally impossible for um, a hacker or an attacker to create that rainbow table right so remember the the hard part is making the table um, and running all the running all the different combinations of passwords through the hash functions in the first place so kind of by adding the salt we create um, longer passwords and increase the computation time required to make those tables. Um, so by adding salts, it's very hard 
to very hard to create a rainbow table um, for that type of an attack. Right? Also, by um, adding random salts, um, instead of using a secret, um, if an attacker were were to figure out our secret, um, and we use that same secret for every user's password, right? Then it would be um, pretty easy to generate that rainbow table still because they can just kind of append our our known secret um, to each to each password and go from there. Um, however, by using random salts, um, each user kind of has a different salt uh, that that encodes their password, right? So that or that is appended to their password uh, before it's before it is hashed. Right, so by figuring out the secret, uh, or so that means um, kind of a different salt has to be used for uh, for each password or for each um, attack. Right, what that means is kind of not only would an attacker have to generate a rainbow table for each password plus the secret or plus any given secret, uh, they would have to do that for every possible salt. Right? So that's once again um, making creating those rainbow tables computationally impossible or just taking way too long. Um, so attackers can't do that. And so let's take a little bit uh, or let's look um, a little bit at the code and see kind of what goes into hashing hashing our passwords um, and how we store those and how we check to make sure that the password the user inputs is correct. It's a first when when a user registers um, we hash that password using the make password hash function here. Uh, we pass in kind of their their username and their password uh, with the default salt is none. So first thing we do uh, we see salt is not there yet um, so we create a salt, right? Make salt uh, just generates random random letters, um, adds them together in one string, and returns that. Right, so then the value that we actually hash is the username um, concatenated with, right? So concatenate just joins two strings together. Um, so we join the username, the password, and the salt. We hash that using SHA-256, right? And then get the hex digest and that um, is H. So what we store in our database um, beside the username is kind of uh, once again a combo or a pair of things. Um, first we have right, our hex digest of the hashed value right, so that we created here um, and we also um, store the salt. Right, That allows us to kind of remember which salt we used uh, to hash each each user's password um, and then we can check that uh, using the correct salt. Right, so when we want to validate a password um, we split on the comma, right? Once again split on the comma we grab the second value, um, so the first index, right? Remember our indexing starts at zero so when we index with one here uh, that grabs the second value which is the salt that we use to create uh, the hash Right, so we remake password the password hash. So we call um, this function again, right? But instead of using uh, no salt and randomly generating a new salt, um, we use the salt we used to hash the password in the first place when we stored it in our database. Right, so then we can compare that against um, we can compare that against the hash value we have stored. If those are the same. Um, then the user has supplied us with the correct password um, and we can allow them to be logged in correctly. Uh, so before we get to the actual walkthrough for today, um, let's just kind of take a look and make sure everything's working correctly. Um, so I'll log in. I will register a new user um, with a super secret password and submit that user um, now at this point kind of I can add movies uh, to my own list that other users haven't added 
or other users may may have added this uh, the same movie also, right? But uh, because I will only see the movies um, that I would like to watch that I personally added. Um, right, so let's just add some movies, right? What we see, um, movies there, right? It added correctly. And if we check out. my ratings um, what we see is my ratings um, is not the functionality is not implemented yet right so I'm logged in um, but what I see at this point is I can see kind of all of the movies that any other users have added to the database um, right so what kind of will work on in this walkthrough is updating uh, and in the studio is updating uh, the watched movies, um, the ratings, um, the list, right, to only show movies um, for the user that's logged in. Right, as an example, um, let me kind of log out with this user. I will log in with my other user with the same super secret password um, as the first user. I submit here, and what I see is kind of even though a different user added Super Troopers to the watch list, um, it displays in, in my watch list, right? Um, so that's kind of the functionality uh, that we want to change now. We want to fully customize kind of each user's page for themselves. Okay, so now that we've gotten caught up um, from our last studio until until the beginning of this walkthrough um, let's start to kind of implement some of the new functionality that we would like um, kind of to allow users to see their their own list of movies and their own version of the web page right so sort of the first thing we want to do um, is we need to allow um, our movie class or our movie model, right? We need to allow um, this, each movie to have a user associated with it, um, right? So we want to know kind of when we look at our database that holds these movies, we want to know um, is a movie which movie uh, is or which user is that movie associated with, right? So kind of the first thing we want to do um, is add an owner field to our movie object, or to our movie model. Um, for our owner, we can use um, what we call a reference type. Right, so what that says, um, what that type is, is a type that refers to um, another, another model, or another database model. Um, so in this case, right, we are referring to the owner field refers to a user. Um, or a, an object or an instance of the user class or, or the user model. Um, right, and kind of as with um, many of the other fields, we will require each movie to have an owner when it's created. Um, so we'll say the, the owner field is required. Right, so now that we have an owner field for our movie, um, when a user adds a movie to their watch list, um, we need to associate that movie with that owner. Um, so let's kind of take a look at our add movie handler. Which what we see is we grab our movie title and we make sure that that movie title is correct. Um, make sure it's not a terrible movie and it's not empty. We escape the movie title um, to ensure that when we display it, um, any HTML that may be or any symbols that may be interpreted as, as HTML by a browser, um, those are escaped or encoded in a different way so that the browser 
um, knows the correct way to display those symbols. And so now, kind of, when we create our movie, um, right, not only is the title required, um, but we also have an owner field that will be required. Right, so we can set our owner equal to um, the user who's currently logged in. This will be self.user. Um, so if we are thinking to ourselves kind of where does this self.user come from? Um, and why can we use self.user here? Um, right, let's um, kind of take a look back at the initialize um, method in the handler class. Right, so remember initialize gets called um, before any request is handled. So an HTTP request comes in uh, from a user. Initialize is called. Um, and it checks to make sure that a user is logged in uh, before that user can see kind of the restricted pages that you need to be logged in to see. Um, so if we kind of wander back up to our handler class, um, take a look at that initialize function. Um, kind of what we see is uh, we, we grab the user ID cookie, um, grab the ID out of that, um, and set self.user to um, the user that we get from uh, from the user table, you calling the get by ID function. So we're using a um, UID that we got from the cookie to grab that user out of the table um, and set self dot user to that. Right. So um, because right because add movie is extends the handler class or is a subclass of the handler. Um, that initialize function gets called before the add movie handler, or before even before um, before any hand any handler um, that extends the handler class, right? So at this point, kind of when we come into this post function, um, self user is set to the correct user that's logged in. Um, so when we when we say owner equals self dot user right here, um, this is kind of the user object um, that we get kind of straight straight out of uh, the user table or the user um, database. Right. Um, so once we have created our movie, added the owner field to that movie, uh, we can put it into the database using the put function. Right, so at this point, um, we have a database full of movies. Each movie has a user field associated with it. Um, so kind of the next thing that we would like to do is update our um, movie ratings and our movie list to show only the movies associated with the logged in user. Um, so we'll start with the movie ratings, um, and then in the studio, you guys will uh, populate the movie list or the home page um, with only movies that that particular user that's logged in would like to watch. Right, so in movie ratings, um, what we see is our current query um, selects all from movie where watched equals true. Right, so uh, what this does is returns kind of returns. Um, all watch movies by any user. Um, so what we'd like to do is kind of update this query um, to select only movies watched by the current user. Um, we are also going to, um, instead of using GQL queries, um, use the ORM functions uh, that are given to us, or that are given to us by the database model. Um, so let's kind of leave this here for now. Um, we'll see that we will get rid of that in a second. And we'll use our ORM functions to perform our query instead of instead of the GQL query. Um, it's 
a little bit easier syntax, easier to keep up with um, kind of what's going on. So we use the all function um, to say look at look at kind of all all of the entries. We'll run kind of filter, which is similar to the to the where clause um, in a query. And remember, we're filtering by um, user and also by watched, right? So we only want um, watched movies. We also only want movies uh, that have the owner associated with the current user, right? So in our filter, um, kind of the first thing we want to do is give it filter by owner um, with the result. self.user, right? So at this point, um, our query will right, select all from movie um, filtered by owner. We can then kind of update that query um, to filter again, right? So remember we want only movies that have been watched. Um, so we'll filter where watched equals true. Okay, so at this point, um, we've set up our query um, to kind of select all and filter by owner and also filter by watched. Right, so the next thing to do is we'll update our watched watch movies list the query result and we will actually run run the query right so these um, so these ORM functions that are given to us kind of build up uh, the query that we'd like to run um, store that into a query object right and then we can use the run function to actually to actually execute that query um, return the results that we would expect Right, so it's just um, a little bit simpler way um, to handle writing SQL or GQL queries, um, kind of using these ORM functions. Right, so I'll now kind of get rid of this watched movies since we don't need it anymore. Um, at this point, we can generate our template. Um, filling in watched movies, and write our response. OK, so now that our um, movie ratings handler will display the correct watched movies for a given user, um, let's kind of take a look at our, our main page, our home page, or our index handler. Right, so remember, um, our home page lists the unwatched movies. Um, so kind of a hole for you guys to do. Right, um, so your job in the studio will be to kind of rewrite uh, this query. Uh, you should use ORM functions um, and filter for um, only movies that the use that the currently logged in user would like would like to watch. You know, kind of um, leave that up to you guys to do in the studio. Um, so there's kind of your first to do. Right, so we would also um, like to add some new functionality to our app or to our website. Um, right, so what we have now is a user logs in and kind of everything 
um, on the site is associated with that user. However, uh, we have this database that has multiple users' data in it. Um, it might be nice to kind of display or allow users to see a little bit um, of what's going on with other users or get some uh, see what's going on in the outside world. Right, so we may um, kind of some functionality that we might like is to see recently watched movies by other users. Or, um, so what we want to do is kind of implement a a new route, a new page um, that allows us to look and see at recently watched movies. Um, right, so kind of the first thing we would do to go about. Um, finding recently watched movies is kind of not only do we not only do we need a date and time for when a movie was added to the un or to the movie list, um, but we might also need a date and time to keep up with when a movie was watched. Right. So if we want to see kind of the most recently watched movies, um, we need to know when those movies were watched so that we can kind of sort our our database query um, by that time and then pick off the most recently watched movies. Right, so let's go ahead and um, to add a new field to our database model um, we need another date time property right um, however we can't really um, set auto now add remember auto now add kind of when this object is created that's set um, so we won't be able to do that um, so what we need to do is kind of first uh, import a library that will allow us um, to use date and time hey we can do that um, by importing from date time uh, we will import date time. Um, so now we have access to to this date time library um, that can allow us to find the current date and time. So we can then kind of add add a new field. We'll call it watch date time. Uh, we'll set that. That will be a date time property as before. Um, however, this time we won't be able to auto add it. Um, we also will not make it required, um, right? So it gets added after a movie's been watched, or it gets set after a movie's been watched, right? So it's not a required field when the movie object is created. All right, so now that we have this watch date time, um, we can head down to the watched movie um, post method, right? So this is, this is uh, called once a user says that they've watched a movie, so a user clicks the I've watched it, um, button submits that form right the post method of our watch movie handler uh, gets called for that route and so we can grab the movie ID get that movie object out of our database um, so what we would like to do is kind of as well as setting um, watch equal to true we also need to update Watch date time. Um, so date time dot now. We'll just simply kind of from that date time library that we imported, use the now function that will grab kind of the current date and time. Um, fill in watch date time with that um, so now we can add add that uh, movie we can put it back into the database update the database right and then render 
our watched it confirmation page. Um, so now that we have um, our watched movie date time set in the database, um, we need to start kind of implementing um, how we actually create this new page, create the new route, and display those um, recently watched movies uh, to out to the user. Right, so um, for now, um, I will do kind of a, a rude and crude quick way um, to handle outputting to the user the um, the correct or the recently watched movies um, for part of the for the studio. You know, the rest of your to-dos will be to um, create the route to the page, um, create a template to display the page nicely, um, and handle moving all the HTML out into that template. Um, but for now, we'll simply get started by um, kind of crudely outputting um, the most recently watched movies to the screen. It's kind of the first thing we want is a new handler uh, to take care of doing this for us. Okay, we'll call it recently watched movies. As with all the other handlers, we will kind of extend the handler class. Right, and what we want to do is kind of implement our get method. Right, so when the user goes to this recently watched movies, um, we output or we send back an HTTP response um, with the with the correct recently watched movies. Right, so kind of the first thing we might want to do is build up our query um, that allows us to search the database, grab those recently recently watched movies. Um, so we'll start with our query. And we'll kind of say movie.all, right? That's essentially kind of select all from movie. Um, we can then kind of build build up our query. Um, right? So we want not only do we want movie.all, uh, but we want to filter. Right? We only want watched movies. So we want watched. Uh, and we only want we want the property watched or the field watched, and we only want um, movies where that's true. Right, so at this point, our query is kind of select all for movie um, where watched is true. Right, we can also kind of continue to build up our query um, by ordering it. Right, so we can set an order. What we'll do here is we'll say a negative for descending. And we want to order by our watch date time field, right? So when when we when we watch that movie. Um, so Remember the negative to begin um, tells it we want kind of descending order. So we're going to have the most recently watched movies first, um, down to the least recently watched movies. Right at this point, um, we can populate a new variable, or a new query result, um, recently watched movies. And we'll simply set it equal to our query we'll say dot fetch um, so that's essentially run the query with some parameters right and our parameter will be we only want to display um, the the 20 most recently watched movies right so we'll say a limit equals 20 right so at this point I'm kind of our queries built up were Remember, we're not filtering by user, um, so we're getting all movies. Um, so it doesn't matter who the owner of that movie is. Um, we're grabbing all movies, sorting them in descending order by 
watch date time um, and fetching the top 20 of those, right? So the 20 most recently watched movies uh, at this point would be stored into recently watched movies. And so now I will um, build up kind of a crude HTML or a crude HTTP response message um, just to display these movies. Right, so for each movie in our recently watched movies list, uh, we'll just concatenate on onto our response the movie's title, and then we'll also add uh, just kind of to make this more readable, add some space between each movie. And we will send the response. We'll write out into our HTTP response um, our response string that we built up and send that back to the user. Right, so this is sort of this is a pretty um, crude way of displaying output. Right, so remember kind of what we've seen so far is the best way um, to display a page or to respond um, with HTML is to push that HTML out into a template right, and pass a parameter into that template and fill in, fill in the template with those parameters. Right, so there's a much better way um, to create this response and send it back, back to the user. Um, for kind of the next to do, um, you guys should create a template um, to display these recently watched movies nicely. Right, sort of at this point also um, we don't have any we don't have any route or any action to get to get to this handler right so remember we need to we need to route or we need to map each route um, to a handler um, so kind of you'll have an extra to do here Um, to create to create that link to create that route um, to the recently watched movies, right, and handle displaying the recently watched movies to the user. So at this point, um, kind of what we have is a way is we've created our recently watched movies handler, right? We query for our for the top twenty most recently watched movies. Um, we have written some code to display them in a rude and crude way. Um, kind of told you you'll need to kind of uh, implement this template. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and create the template, get that started um, for you. And so we'll create this recently watched.html template.
And so as always, um, we extend extend the base.html template. Um, we are implementing the block named content. Right, so what that means is this block that we write in here, or this template, is filling in um, for the block for the block content kind of placeholder in the base.html template. Um, let's let's give ourselves a title. After we have a title, um, kind of your last to do have to remember we're in HTML here, um, so our comments are a little bit different. Right? But your last to do is to Implement this template, right? Um, so when you check out kind of the when you check out the Studio Code, um, these to dos will be a little bit better explained um, with some more details. So make sure you uh, check for the to dos in there um, and handle those appropriately, following those details. Um, so kind of what we have at this point is um, even though we've written this code to display the movie titles, right? Um, we currently don't have a route, a working route to get to this handler, right? Um, so as you kind of the first thing you might want to do is kind of implement that route, um, implement um, kind of a link to that to that route um, somewhere, um, right? Preferably in kind of your base.html uh, File, right so remember we have kind of our different links our different links to routes and um, we have a link to our list a link to our ratings page um, kind of what we might also want to do is add in add in a couple more to do's here right so once again I forget it's HTML Okay, um, so kind of the first thing we might want is a link to the recently watched movies. Um, that'll allow us to um, get to that handler, get to that router, or get to the route that you also have to create um, as kind of one of your other to dos. Um, that'll tell it, you know, link to the recently watched movies handler um, and display the recently watched movies, um, right? You'll also kind of, once you've created that template, um, you should render that template there instead of kind of the crude displaying that we've got done currently. Right, so we should create this link here. Um, after you've created the route also, we'll route to the appropriate handler, um, call that git, and display the correct, the recently watched movies. Um, kind of something else that might be useful, right, is at this point users can log in. Um, I don't know if you remember kind of looking back whenever I logged out, um, but if we check out our main code, um, we have a route to the logout to the logout handler, to the logout um, action. So we have this route, tells us to go to the logout handler, and our logout worked correctly. Um, but if you remember earlier, I had to get to that by manually kind of typing the route into the, into the URL. Right? Um, so I had to manually log out by inserting um, the correct path, the correct route, 
into the URL. Right, so one other thing um, you should do is create a link to allow a user to log out. Right, so we need a link to that route, to that logout route um, that will log the user out for us, right, and call that logout function, or call the get function of the logout. Logout class. Uh, so I believe those are all of your responsibilities for the studio. Um, and that's all we have for the walkthrough. Um, so remember at this point, kind of we've implemented, um, we've built users into the database, and we've created a new, a new database to hold our users. Um, we've related that database kind of to our movie database by associating each movie with an owner um, that is a, a user. We have blocked all of the private pages um, from any any um, potential users who aren't logged in. Right? We've verified logins, um, allowed users to create registration, um, allowed users to log in. Um, we can now we now display in our watched movie list um, movies that are have only or that have watched are been watched only by um, that particular user that's logged in. Um, what's left kind of for you to do um, is on the home page or on the index page, right, to display the watch list corresponding to movies that only that user would like to see. Um, also, to implement kind of the different functionality in the recently watched movies, um, the new recently watched movies functionality, right? So you need to implement the template uh, that displays recently watched movies. Uh, you also need to create the route and link to that page. And you also need to create a link that will allow the user to log out. Um, so right at this point kind of users can log in but can't log out. Um, so those are kind of your objectives for the studio. Um, so good luck on those. And go ahead and get started. Um, so kind of uh, I want to go ahead and show you guys kind of one typo that I made um, and then kind of show you what will happen, uh, what could happen when you start to test in the Google App Engine. Um, it's kind of first thing. Um, I uh, What I had here to begin with um, was reference type, right? Obviously reference type doesn't exist, right? What I wanted was reference property. Um, so you're kind of running through the walkthrough again. Um, there's one quick error. Okay, uh, so now I want to kind of quickly show what happens when I run this application. Um, right, so when I click Browse, um, what I see is this nice error message. Right, so as I kind of scroll down, um, kind of the gist of this is the owner field is required um, now. So we've created this new this new movie, uh, or we've added an owner field and a date time, uh, a watch date time to the movie class. Um, however, uh, my data store, my database is not is still um, kind of up to date as far as. Um, when I was running this code kind of before before making these updates. Um, so this might be something that you run into also. Um, right, so I showed you guys kind of what was in the data store uh, before the walkthrough. Um, if we kind of remember we can go to the SDK console um, and grab a nice view of sort of what's going on. 
um, in our data store. If I look at data store viewer, what I see is I kind of I still have these old objects or these old objects in my data store, right? Um, uh, so, so these movies that I had added previously, um, and what we see is there's no owner field, um, right? So when I, when uh, the when we're trying to kind of query this view, this database, kind of the first thing that pops up is, you know, there's movie uh, object in the database. However, the owner field's required, and these do not have the owner field there. Um, so the way the Google App Engine, when you're running in the testing environment, which we're doing, right, so we, we're not publishing our apps um, on the actual web, right, we're just running in the testing environment. Uh, what it does is it sets up a file, a local file, that simulates uh, the same way the data store would act. Um, so really, instead of our, instead of our data actually being maintained on a server in a database somewhere by Google, um, what's really happening is uh, the Google App Engine kind of local testing environment is just reading and writing um, our entries in and out from a file that's just stored on our local computer. Um, so I'm going to try a few things. Hopefully I can kind of clear what's in the data store. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to do that, but we'll figure it out. Um, I'll just try this flush first, see if that does anything. Um, doesn't look like it. Let's see if we also look at the user side, right? We have kind of our users that I created earlier, Shidel and John. Right, but still not helping. Um, so what I would like to do is clear these data stores. Um, let's Hey, here we go. Let's delete our users, right? Then let's delete our movies, and we will just start from scratch for our testing. And I guess it's possible that they're still in cache, so let's go ahead and flush our cache. Okay, uh, so let's come back here. Let's try this again. All right, um, great. So now our data store is empty, right? We're not. Um, we're not running into this no or bad value error because the owner is required but it wasn't there um, so let's kind of start from scratch see if we can get through see if we um, got through the walkthrough without making any errors um, also what I did is I went ahead and implemented um, the route and the links uh, just for testing to get to the recently watched movies page um, so if we click here Obviously, an error. Um, great. We'll see how to fix that. Okay, so um, sort of take a look at our error. Right, we see kind of type error get. Uh, it takes no arguments, but one's given, right? So let's um, kind of take a look at what that most likely means, right? Is in the recently watched handler that I created, um, I have kind of my get method. Um, however, I forgot to pass self, right? So remember, or I forgot to tell, I forgot to to say that the get method takes one parameter uh, of itself, right? So remember, self gets passed in uh, by default. Right, which leads to us getting this error. Um, one was given, that was self, so we're trying to call the get method with an argument, or so with self as a parameter. Right? However, I declared that function to take no arguments, um, so we get a type error. Right? So um, let's see what happens if I save this, refresh here. Okay, great. Um, remember where our initialization blocks us from going to any pages because we're not logged in. Uh, so at this point we can create a user. Uh, 
Um, we're logged in now. Um, let me try to add a bad movie. Well, that doesn't work. Um, let's do the quick and easy thing and go by numbers so we don't have to write out write them all out. So at this point we see our list, right? Our ratings are empty. Recently watched movies um, is empty, right? Also um, because it's empty and because we don't have our template implemented yet, um, we don't have any nice any nice output. Um, so let's go to my list, let's say I watched it, check recently watched movies. Okay, um, so that's good. But we don't have our templates. So once again, you know, nothing nothing fancy here, but we're just making sure everything works. Say that we've watched them all. Um, we can rate them. Our ratings page works just fine. Uh, recently watched, right? Once again, not great. Um, so I haven't added a logout link yet, um, so I'll just kind of force the force the app to do that uh, for me. Let me create a new user. Right, so at this point we're at we're logged in as a different user, right? So when I go to my ratings, the ratings from uh, user ID John are not here, right? I only have the movies in my list. But if I go to recently watched, let's see we've seen the recently watched movies um, from all users in the system, um, right? Which is the correct functionality, which is what we want to see. Um, so if I were to watch Star Wars four, then recently watched. Right, we see um, there's movies from all users, so from user John and user Shydell. Right, so everything seems to be working. Um, awesome. So at this point, kind of, you guys are good to go on the studio.